Hey everybody, this is Brad Dyke. Uh, one last video for tonight, and it's because it's a really popular demand. And it's about dealing with these SAS hard drives and how to diagnose them. They're not easy. And the reason why they're not easy is because of the edge connector interface. It's not detectable by a motherboard. Most motherboards, most of them, uh, not necessarily counting the server quality motherboards in the industry, but most motherboards have what we call a SATA base connection. Now SATA is common and SATA is compatible to SATA drives. But what you don't know is SATA connectors, see, that's a SATA connection for an SSD SATA drive. But what you don't know is SATA is also compatible to SAS drives, see? And this is what gets everybody in trouble because they think, oh, I could just get myself a SATA cable and plug it up and put it on my motherboard and eh, I can't even get the thing to spin up. Correct. Why? Let me show you. The nature of SATA is just that. It's serial inline data handling. That's what it does. It's single mode. In other words, it writes or it reads. That's how it works. Now, SAS, on the other hand, if you look at it, is straight edge. Okay? So because it's straight edge, and you look real close, you'll see why. Now that's a problem. When you're dealing with said configuration, SAS is dual serial connectivity. And so when you put them side by side, you can actually see the differences between them. But wait a minute, didn't somebody say that you can get these SAS cables that have the head of a SAS connection right here and yet they have a SATA head connector on this end. No. This only works with parallel state configurations of a controller card. In other words, if you've seen my videos, I said go out and get yourself a 4 bay, okay, or an 8 bay. And what happens is you use something like this to connect to the SATA bridging connections on the back end of the SAS bus card. And, you know, it would be like, uh, well, here, I'll give you an example. This guy right here is a bay, a drive bay, and it has two bridge connection SAS connectors on the back. Or you can get a version of this that has four, uh, has in this case, eight SATA connection interfaces on it to accomplish what you want to do. Now, the cool thing about that is you can use SATA as part of SAS, but that's the only way. So that's what I was saying, guys, go out there and get yourself this kind of cable with a bus board and you, know, you can put four drives in at a time. You can diagnose them, you can format them side by side and so on and so on. But over the past few years, the products have gotten better. The other thing it's missing in the discussion is the Molex interface connection. The Molex interface connection is very similar to these guys, okay? And they require a kind of hookup that you're going to have to take care of if you're going to use a splitter like something like this. How do you get past all this? Well, actually, something came out that did a very good job to answer that very question. And I'm going to show you this. This has the SAS connection right here. You take this off. There it is. Here is one of my favorite LS9200 series SAS internals. This is an internal port right here. And this guy just plugs right in like that. And that is your internal connection for diagnosing equipment. Now, this end is different. As you can see, there are four fully powered fully SAS integrated 
connectors. But they've done the rewiring so that the, the Molex interface is ready to go. So I could take the SAS drive, this one right here, and I can directly plug it right in. See? And I'm ready. Now, you still have the same problem. If you want to do many of them, you need at least a few of these quad cable distributors. Now, I'll put in my video the link to this product and a recommendation for a 9200 type class card. You don't need anything fancy. You really don't. A 6 gig is fine. Don't get a 12 gig. I mean, this, we're talking about diagnostic stations, okay? It's just wasted money if you do anything more complicated, unless you want to build something more substantial. Now, what do I mean by that? Okay. Well, this guy does a lot more than four drives. It can do a whole heck of a lot more. It can do 32 and 32, or and more, depending on the type of card you get. Let me give you an example. Now this card has four interfaces and is designed to run hundreds of drives. Now it has no internal ports for internal connectivity, so this kind of cable interface will not work. Well, what will work will be one of these. These guys. And to be specific, this type of port right here. It's an external SAS bridge connection. So, if you're smart and you're doing a lot of these hard drives because you want to build your own data center, get yourself an, a disk array of some type. The you know, 24, 26 series, the bridge sets, the NetApp, the EMCs, they're out there. They're a dime a dozen, 50 to 75 bucks. They'll require dual power supply. They'll require a SAS interface cable that would go to an HBA or a RAID controller like this versus an internal like this. Why? Well, because you went out and you bought yourself a whole bunch of hard drives you want to repurpose for your data center and you need to test them to make sure they pass and you also most likely need to reformat them from 520 sector interleaves to 512 standard interleaves which is what we call the standard PC industry guideline. So that particular style of format means that we're going to be able to do everything you want but at the same point in time uh, if you're doing bulk get a 24 disk array 3.5 inch or 2.5 inch. I do nowadays 2.5 inch only. But uh, by the way, just as just to let you know that this SATA disk on this Molex SAS interface cable, look at this. Would it help if I turned it around. Look at that SATA. So you can test SATA disks too, and SAS disks. Why? Because you have a common uniformal edge connector. See the missing L bracket in the middle? That's important. And it enables the rest of the contacts for either single data transfer rates or dual serial transfer rates. All you need, because your motherboard does not have the ability to do this, is an HBA or a RAID controller that matches your SAS requirement. Now on that discussion, the LS9200s, these guys, simple, cheap, efficient, cool, no holes bar, not difficult, detects, runs diagnostics, does everything you want it to do before you even touch it. It will fail a hard drive that is failing with very little effort on your part. So that's one way to make things a little easier on you, right? So, with that being said, a last piece of advice I want to give you is to go to my video uh, about running multi-formatting protocols or multi-disk asking processes within the Linux environment if you want to deal with things like formatting 520 to 512 and so on 
one individual, and I haven't done it yet, has sent me some information, which I thought was pretty cool, that talked to um, a stripe set execution, which would do all available bus drives. So you could populate your, LS, um, your LSI uh, HBA controller, 24 drives, run the string command, and it will do all 24 drives once, which is pretty sweet. Um, and it does it simultaneously, so you're not just doing it in sequential order. You're doing 24 drives all at once, because you can. Why not, right? Learn how to use the more advanced environments. Now, with that, the last thing I'll bring back up one more time, uh, and I know it will come up as a question, and I know people are going to ask, uh, I got a rate card out here that meets this requirement, and I got an HBA card. Um, HBAs, host bus adapter cards, serve a very general function, and they transfer the DMA functionalities, that's disk management, aggregate control, uh, over to the next level. In this case, like ZFS, or you're going to have an operating environment that will take over that, like Windows or TrueNAS or something like that. The only thing that the HBAs will do is obviously recognize in a very native mode, the disk mode environment, it will have local disk management resources. So that means you can format it and things like that. Uh, and that's called uh, D, uh, disk management um, command. I think it's uh, uh, DM, uh, DMC, something like that. Um, and that's it. Uh, it hands off all the rest of the work to whatever Linux environment or whatever you're going to use to manage the disks. RAID, on the other hand, RAID cards are different. Now, they come from my generation. They're super intelligent cards. Like they run a compatibility requirement, but that's important because they only run what is optimal in the bias level. In other words, all of the functionality of the disk management is in the hardware level. It doesn't care about the operating system. It presents the disk as RAID 0 to the format, regardless if it's RAID 1, 5, 6, whatever. Uh, the principal reason why it does that is because it's responsible for taking care of hot swapping and failed drives. It does everything you need it to do. It does have also RDM which is RAID Disk Management Communication, which is a logging protocol you can use to monitor what's going on at the operating system level if you want to. But advanced systems that use RAID controls or RAID technology, because reinventation of this technology is happening today and it's being done in things like ZFS. If you're old school like me, you know ZFS is hardware. Oracle hardware to be exact. When Sun Microsystems was purchased by Oracle, they introduced these platforms known as the ZFS storage arrays. They were pieces of junk, but the protocol was pretty solid. So they developed a software protocol, which is two layers above RAID standard protocols, and they started managing disk storage capacity at the OS level. It has value. I'm not saying it doesn't. I'm saying that it's at that level versus way down here. You don't need anything with a RAID, a true native RAID card. You don't. Uh, all you have to do is go into the BIOS when you reboot the machine, take a look at what's inside. You can optimize it. Uh, if you have a battery support component to it, uh, the battery is designed to give just enough power to finish the last write cycle to your hard drives, which is pretty incredible when you think about it. Uh, they're very flexible. They're very capable. But HBA cards are extraordinarily simple. They don't require a lot of um, knowledge to start to use them. It's as dumb as connecting a SATA disk, you know, truth to be. And that simplicity has value to it. I have value. I, I enjoy using HBAs on certain cases because uh, on the Dell 720DX, I'm using a RAID controller for the spinning disks environments, and I'm using an HBA for the SSDs because I've stripped out all the overhead, so I'm gonna get the maximum return on those HBAs uh, pathways because the SSDs maximize the channels. 
So I get absolutely six gigs of bandwidth on a six gig net on a I'm sorry a, a six gig HBA. Pretty sweet. Now you swap that out with a 12 gig HBA, it's still going to saturate because when you've got NVMe or SSD discs in your system, they are far greater and far higher I/O than most controllers in the industry today. Today they're reinventing the nature of, of controllers just to try to get ahead of such fast bandwidth that SSD drives can offer. And the cool thing about SSD drives that I have learned is the degradation of SSD drives is very little when you've got 24, or 64, or 32, or just piles and piles and piles of SSD cards because when you use spinning disks in these kind of standings, um, they very quickly become slow. There is a cross point. You know, go down versus going up. And in the middle, right when those two guys meet, that's it. After that, it just goes downhill. SSDs, not the case. I have seen pretty nice overall performance and requirements on what I've been testing so far. I haven't pushed the limit because I just don't have the funds to have 100 plus SSD drives yet. But to be able to route those through HBA protocols using disk arrays, counting the latency of the disk arrays themselves, the physical hardware, and the latency of the controllers, um, when I compare that to a spinning disk, you know, this guy right here versus something like this, I'm like, wow, that's just too good to pass up. Let's go buy more SSD drives. So with that being said, hey, go out there, buy a batch of hard drives, see what you get. You will have some bad ones. Buy in bulk. They've been running for a while. They're going to die. It's not if, it's when. Make sure that you set up hot swap drives. Make sure you test cycle your drives as well. The cool thing about HBAs and RAID controllers, and this is my last part of the segment, is that they have pretty advanced diagnostics interfacing with what is known as the smart disk protocol. Now SSDs don't work so well with smart, but spinning disks are excellent. They power down, they have they do diagnostic runs on their RPM rate levels, they don't spin up correctly, if they don't maintain their RPMs, if they don't do anything precisely correct, they're failed. They're tagged as bad and out the big door it goes. And that's nice, because you didn't do any of that work. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? Okay, I'm done talking. I'm talking too much. I hope this helped. Remember, look down below in this. I will give you the link to this guy. And I will give you a recommendation on a couple of uh, different kinds of RAID controllers or HBA controllers. And give you the ability to uh, get these. And I'll even put in a couple of recommendations for disk arrays. If you want to go internal using the SATA bridge cables, or if you want to go external using SAS or mini SAS or external cat SAS uh, to do what you want to do. Hopefully this will be of value to you. I apologize to anyone out there who might get confused when dealing with these older style cable sets. They do work, but you need to make sure that you have the controllers on the, on the, on the IO side and you've got the bus cards to plug these SATA connections into, as well as power outputs and so on to make them work. This guy is the all-inclusive solution. It works great, very functional, but they only have a short, they do have a short life. If you flex them a lot, they are subject to have some connectivity issues because it is copper wire after all. So try not to move them around a great deal and bend the wiring a lot. Uh, it's no different than any other wire, wire out there. All right. Well, I hope you guys have a great week. Probably won't get anything from me next week, but I'll come back in a couple of weeks and resume. God bless and take care.